Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks everybody. And I, I think that uh, today is a very special day for all of us because we have the opportunity to share with uh, people from all around the world uh, an amazing day and amazing uh, lessons about congenital heart disease and about transposition. It's uh, close to impossible to have uh, such a speaker at the same time in the same uh, room of uh, conference all over the world, but it is now possible to have all of them at the same time, the same bit. So it's uh, for us something amazing and Congenital Art Academy is growing very fast. And uh, I thank all of you and uh, our delegates. And for re this reason, on behalf of uh, Professor Bernowski Gill, who is the, with me, the founder of the Congenital Art Academy, and uh, with uh, Grace Van Lue, who is uh, co-chairing with me the Congenital Art Academy, we welcome all of you. And uh, this is a very special moment, and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to add something on your clinical practice, and at least add something of what you are doing every day with transposition with the congenital heart patient. So I'm passing the, the voice and the face to Grace uh, Van Luven, and uh, I hope you will enjoy. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is a, a very uh, special day to, to all of us. Uh, this is our uh, third webinar, and we have another uh, things that are going on on Congenital Heart Academy. And today, uh, it ended up to be a very, very special day. Dr. Adib Jateni, who is Brazilian, as myself, uh, was supposed to turn uh, 91 years old today if he was uh, still with us. So this is a special day because uh, my chance and we have another uh, things that are going on on Congenital Heart Academy. And today uh, it ended up to be a very, very special day. Dr. Adib Jateni, who is Brazilian, as myself, uh, was supposed to turn uh, 91 years old today if he was uh, still with us. So this is a special day because uh, my chance and we have another uh, things that are going on on Congenital Heart Academy. And today, uh, it ended up to be a very, very special day. Dr. Do you Adib have Jackson echo, guys? I'm yes, having, I'm myself. listening a big uh, echo. Was supposed to turn, it's turning, uh, yes. years old today, if he was uh, still with us. So this is a special day because... Uh, I'm I mute. It's, it's repeating. It's repeating. Yeah. Okay. Now I think it's normal, right? Yes, I think okay. so. Okay. So, so just uh, to, to tell you that. So... It was uh, something that it was very beautiful, especially for us from Brazil. And uh, with the Department of Congenital Heart Diseases of the Brazilian Society of Cardiology, we decided that uh, today is going to be a beautiful day that we could uh, dedicate to the memory of Dr. Uh, Adib Jatem. And uh, we want to uh, invite all the uh, societies, especially for us uh, around the world, to join us on something that we want to start today as the TGA Day. So we hope that this day will be remembered every year as a day that we could uh, talk a lot, a lot and learn more about TGA in the memory of uh, Dr. Uh, Jatin. And, and we are very happy to have Marcelo Jatini, who is uh, the son of Dr. Adib, uh, to speak uh, more about this uh, today. Very good. And another thing that I want to tell you is about uh, the Congenital Heart Academy delegates. So we want uh, to have people from, from all around the world to help us to spread the news. We want Congenital Heart Academy to reach uh, every country, every place, so people can help us to uh, diffuse our, our voice, so what we want people to learn, and we want them to share their experiences and the, the local uh, experiences that are amazing as well. So we are very happy. We have uh, already... Uh, all of these countries represented with us. And uh, if your country is not uh, uh, read yet, please uh, send us an email. We want to you to join us and uh, bring your expertise, your skills, your country's uh, experience, and you're going to uh, help us to uh, get the information uh, being delivered in the places that uh, it should be. 
And just to finalize, uh, we want uh, to give you a save the date. So every Thursday at the same time, we are preparing very nice uh, webinars for you. So we, we, we intend to continue to have uh, every Thursday, at least until July, uh, one uh, meeting. So please save the day. So the next one's going to be cardiac anesthesia. And uh, we, we are going to have another activity this Monday that is going to be about uh, clinical uh, cardiogenetics. It's going to be very, very interesting. So next Monday at uh, 3 uh, European uh, time. So please follow us on the social medias. Then you can have uh, all the information about the the the, in, the uh, meetings that we are uh, preparing. Thank you very much for that. And now I want uh, to uh, start our very special meeting that we are dedicating to dedicating to uh, Dr. Adib Jaten with uh, Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson uh, doesn't need any introduction, but now he is uh, a visiting professor fellow at Newcastle University, and he is going to talk about the truth is beauty and beauty is truth about the morphology of transposition. Welcome and thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Yes. So the topic we will discuss today has been controversial for well over a century. The picture you're seeing here is the first example we are aware of this specific lesion, which is the drawing made by Matthew Bailey in 1796. And he had no problem when he first saw the lesion. He simply called it a singular anomaly. In the time that has passed, we have come to realize that the essence of the lesion is the presence of discordant ventricular arterial connections. So what do we mean by that? We mean that rather than rising from morphologically left ventricle, the aorta takes its origin from the right ventricle or from its rudiment, and also the pulmonary trunk takes its origin from the left ventricle or its rudiment. The potential problem with this definition, however, is that this specific ventricular arterial connection can be found with various atrioventricular connections. And that is why I have emphasized the aorta can arise either from the morphologically right ventricle or from it's rudiment. So when we look at the other atrioventricular connections, most frequently we see discordant ventricular arterial connections with concordant atrioventricular connections. And it is this combination that will be the topic of our discussion today. But the discordant ventricular arterial connections can also be found when the atrioventricular connections are discordant. And then the two discordances cancel each other out. We can also find discordant ventricular arterial connections when there are isomeric atrial appendages, the arrangement often called heterotaxy, nowadays much better, split up into its two constituents parts, left isomerism, right isomerism. And in the setting of right isomerism, it is frequent to find a situation of discordant ventricular arterial connections. But then, because of the isomeric appendages, the atrioventricular connections are mixed. We can find discordant ventricular arterial connections with double inlet ventricle, particularly double inlet left ventricle. And indeed, it is double inlet left ventricle with discordant ventricular arterial connections, that is the commonest variant. And we can also find discordant ventricular arterial connections when one atrioventricular connection is absent, as we see quite frequently with tricuspid atresia. But as I've already said, the combination we are going to be considering today is that of concordant atrioventricular and discordant ventricular arterial connections. And since this is the most frequent combination, 
It is my opinion now we should take this as the default option. And in that respect, we can simply call the combination transposition. And then we can use specific descriptions for those other combinations, such as the double discordant combination, which of course is congenitally corrected transposition. But today, we are going to concentrate on concordant atrioventricular and disc. So let's see what happens to the circulation when we have these two connections. I'm showing you the arrangement at the moment in which the morphologically right atrium is to the right side, and the blood coming back from the morphologically right atrium goes into the morphologically right ventricle because the atrioventricular connections are concordant. But then, because the aorta is arising from the morphologically right ventricle, the blood is running in parallel rather than in series. And that is the problem with this combination. So on the other side, the pulmonary venous return coming back to the morphologically left atrium goes through the morphologically left ventricle, but then is pumped back to the lungs. And this, of course, is the combination that we see with usual atrial arrangement. But it will be immediately obvious that we can have exactly the same combination, albeit very much rarer, when everything is mirror imaged. So when the morphologically right atrium is left-sided, as in mirror imaged arrangement, with concordant atrioventricular connections, the morphologically right ventricle is similarly left-sided. And we have left-handed ventricular topology. And then when we have transposition in this setting, the aorta receiving the blood from the morphologically right ventricle, but pumping it back into the systemic circulation is left-sided. And so when we have the mirror image derangement, Morphologically left atrium is obviously right-sided, as is the morphologically left ventricle, and so is the pulmonary trunk. But once again, because of the combination of concordant atrioventricular, discordant ventricular arterial connections, the circulations are running in parallel rather than in series, and that is the root of the problem. Often nowadays we hear this combination called D transposition, but that gives me problems because I've already illustrated to you that the combination we've seen is not always associated with a right sided aorta. Indeed, when we have transposition with concordant atrioventricular connections. Sasha, you think to unmute? I think you need to unmute. We can't uh, hear Dr. Uh, Anderson anymore. When, as I've shown you, we have transposition in the setting of mirror image derangement in Van Pragen terminology, transposition ILL, then neither do we have a D loop, nor do we have a right sided aorta. So, in this combination, there is no question but that it is inappropriate to call this D-transposition, and it would also be inappropriate to call it L-transposition, because in most circumstances, L-transposition is considered to represent congenitally corrected transposition, but that is also less than perfect. So although they are popular, I suggest these shorthand terms, D and L-transposition, are inaccurate, potentially misleading, the more so when, for the default option, we can simply talk about transposition. So what are the variables we find when we have concordant atrioventricular connections and discordant ventricular arterial connections? Well, you will all have appreciated by now that one of the most significant variations is the relationship between the arterial trunks. So in most instances, we find an anterior right-sided aorta, but that is not always the case. And indeed, 
on very rare occasions, the aorta may not even be anterior. So it is the connections that underscore the problems. Infundibular morphology is also not constant. So in most instances, there is infundibulum in the right ventricle. There is fibrous continuity between the pulmonary valve and the mitral valve in the left ventricle. But again, this is not constant. And on occasion, we can have bilateral infundibulums. On exceedingly rare occasions, we can have aortic to mitral fibrous continuity. Much more important, however, are the associated malformations. And it is these associated malformations that complicate arrangements of concordant atrioventricular, discordant ventricular arterial connections. Perhaps the most important is deficient ventricular septation, but added to that, we must consider obstruction of the outflow from the morphologically left ventricle. So how do we take care of these associated malformations? In my opinion, we analyze and describe them just as we would had they been present in the setting of concordant atrioventricular connections and concordant ventricular arterial connections. So here I'm showing you the possibilities for the ventricular septal defect when the aorta arises from the morphologically right ventricle, the pulmonary trunk from the morphologically left ventricle, discordant ventricular arterial connections. And in most instances, the defect will be perimembranous. And the phenotypic feature of the perimembranous defect, as in the setting of concordant ventricular arterial connections, will be fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the mitral and tricuspid valves. But in the setting of transposition, it is the pulmonary valve that is, in most instances, also in fibrous continuity with the atrioventricular valves. One of the frequent features in the statin transposition, however, is malalignment between the muscular outlet septum and the remainder of the muscular ventricular septum. We can have muscular defects anywhere within the ventricular septum, and then very rarely we can have the third type of ventricular septal defect, that which is characterized by fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the arterial valves, making a defect doubly committed and juxtaarterial. And as is the case in the setting of concordant ventricular arterial connections, this type of defect most frequently has a muscular postural inferior rim, but it can extend becoming to become perimembranous. So what about the substrates for obstruction from the left ventricular outflow tract? In the setting of discordant ventricular arterial connections, it is, of course, the pulmonary route which is supported by the morphologically left ventricle. But any of the lesions which, in a heart with concordant ventricular arterial connections, can produce aortic obstruction will produce pulmonary stenosis in the setting of transposition. So we may find that the stenosis is present at valvar level. More problematic is when there is a ventricular septal defect and the outlet septum, be it muscular or fibrous, is deviated to obstruct the outflow from the left ventricle. This is the combination that underscores the Rastelli procedure, nowadays the Nikaido, or the uh, REV procedures. So a particularly important combination. But we can also have bulging of the ventricular septum, either with deficient ventricular septation or when there is uh, a ventricular septal defect made worse by a fibrous shelf. We can also have tissue tags which blow through from high pressure right ventricle, and on rare occasions, there can be abnormal attachments of the valvular tension apparatus. So, ventricular septal defects, left ventricular outflow, tract obstruction, these are the lesions which most frequently make transposition complex rather than simple, which is the way we describe it when the ventricular septum is intact. 
The other thing we have to take into account, however, are the coronary arteries. And there are many ways and many classifications that have been devised to describe the arrangements of the coronary arteries. In my opinion, the multiple ways the coronary arteries can be arranged are so great that no simple or Christian classification can cope for all the variations. So it is my preference to use a descriptive approach, and we need to take care of sinusal the arterial pedicles. Do the arteries run behind the pulmonary trunk, or is there an artery running in front of the aortic outflow tract from the right ventricle? Of particularly importance is when the arteries take an intramural course, one or other of the major arteries running between the arterial trunks. It's also important to take note of accessory arteries, or indeed to note when one of the major arteries may be absent. And nowadays, we're beginning to take in account also of commissure mismatch. But most important is the sinusal origin of the coronary arteries. And if we look at this picture of our heart with transposition viewed from above, there we see the aorta, which in this instance is indeed anterior and right-sided. The feature of coronary arteries is that almost without exception, they take their origin from the two sinuses of the aortic roots that are adjacent to the pulmonary trunk. I am aware of only one or two examples throughout the world ever being described in which a coronary artery arises from the non-adjacent aortic sinus but we must bear that in mind. But to all intents and purposes, we can think of the arteries arising from these two adjacent sinuses. So if we are to describe the variations, we need to distinguish between these sinuses. And in my opinion, that is best done on the basis of the so-called Leiden Convention. And that relates the sinuses to the way they are seen as the surgeon considering himself or herself as a mannequin standing in an unadjacent sinus, looking towards the pulmonary trunk, judges the two sinuses adjacent to the trunk as being either to the right hand, the sinus to the right hand is considered number one, and in most instances that gives rise to the main stem of the left coronary artery, which then branches to give rise to the circumflex and the anterior interventricular arteries. If one of the sinuses is to the right hand, then of necessity, the other sinus will be to the left hand. And we distinguish that as sinus number two. And in the commonest variant, this gives rise to the right coronary artery. And this usual arrangement where the left main stem, the circumflex, the anterior interventricular arteries come from sinus one, right coronary artery from sinus two, this is found in two-thirds of most cases when there is intact ventricular septum and almost two-thirds with ventricular septum defect. But anything is possible. And indeed, we now must take account that very rarely a coronary artery may arise from an adjacent sinus. But if we describe sinusal origin, we then account for the course of these arteries relative to either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta, and we describe everything descriptively, we can take care of all those variations, taking particular note of the intramural variations. What is commissure or mismatch? That is found when the commissure of the pulmonary trunk is not opposite the commissure of the aorta, and that increases the distance between one of the coronary arteries the sinus of the pulmonary trunk into which it will be transferred to produce the neo-aorta. And that is now coming to the fore as another of the possible variants. So if I put everything together, to me now, transposition is simplified as the default option for discordant ventricular arterial connections in the setting of concordant atrioventricular connections. And then if we take care of all the associated malformations, we count BSD, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, 
remembering that we now need also to describe the varying arterial relationships in fundibular morphology. And in my opinion, transposition becomes very simple to describe and also to understand. Grace. Yes, very nice. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. It was it was amazing. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I think we can answer the, them on the break that we are going to we are going to have soon. So now, uh, Dr. Gilvernovsky, our co-founder, and uh, my slides up, team. Yes. And they're in the presentation mode, is that correct? Uh, yes, perfect. It's coming, yeah, now it's, it's, it's coming. Okay, um, I'll start. Um, we're learning about this process, everyone, uh, and apologize for little glitches in the audio uh, that, we're, that we're hearing. Um, we're also learning how to use the answer questions live function in our chat box, so please bear with us for that. Um, the, the Academy has been absolutely, let me just see if I can advance that, there we go. The Academy has been really a, an amazing example of how we can learn internationally on behalf of Jeff Jacobs, who I know is on the call and is a co-chair with me for the Eighth World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery. I encourage you to write down um, these dates uh, as this will be occurring um, well, in about 16 months now, I think, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit concerning. But uh, one of the things that we are learning is that without question, we need a streaming option for the World Congress, in addition to hoping that we all get together, whoever can come to Washington, D.C. So we're learning a lot from this. In your course evaluations, please let us know how you think uh, this is going. Um, so in a relatively short amount of time, I am going to talk about some pretty complicated physiology, uh, talk a little bit about the circulatory effects of um, prostaglandin, uh, how we as intensivists and inpatient docs can get the baby set up best for cardiac surgery. So one of the unique things about transposition physiology is it can be distinguished from either single ventricle physiology or a normal series circulation in that it is the only situation in the human where the pulmonary artery oxygen saturation oxygen saturation is higher than that of the aorta. We also use the term for this, which I think is correct, about a parallel circulation rather than in series. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to use these box diagrams where on your left is the systemic circulation starting with the systemic venous return through the right atrium, right ventricle, and then systemic blood flow from the aorta. And on your right, the pulmonary venous return left atrium, left ventricle, and pulmonary artery. And in this situation, and you can see here where the labels are, in this situation, the venous return comes into the atrium and then goes back and is recirculated to the body. So if we look at the so-called parallel circulation, after the baby is born and separated from the placenta, uh, in the absence of any uh, communication between these circuits, we end up with very congested lungs, but a very hypoxemic baby, uh, as shown here on the left. So over short periods of time, and, and the, um, the physiologic mechanisms that manage this and, and keep this going are a little bit unclear, but the amount of blood that goes from the blue side to the pink side needs to be exactly the same as what goes from the pink side to the blue side. Otherwise, and I'll show you an example of this, one circuit will completely fill up and the other one will be empty. So that's over short periods of time, over minutes to hours. However, because pulmonary vascular resistance falls, eventually we start seeing more blood going from the systemic side to the pulmonary side, just as we see in structurally normal hearts. And over time, there is increasing amounts of pulmonary blood flow, Eventually, the pulmonary blood flow shown on the left as QP becomes significantly greater than the systemic blood flow. The pulmonary circulation and the left ventricle become volume overloaded, 
we end up with an x-ray that looks like that in the upper left-hand corner of cardiomegaly, um, increased pulmonary vascular markings, and I guess you could call that an egg on side. Um, and I, I had the opportunity to uh, learn much of this from a cardiologist named Milton Paul. Milton uh, was a cardiologist at uh, uh, what was called Children's Memorial at the time, which is now Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, and spent really the early part of his career detailing this physiology in days when the only way we could investigate it was with cardiac catheterization. And this is one of uh, the figures that he used to explain this to me and is in a chapter we wrote a number of years ago together. And over time, when you catheterize children at an average of about two to three months after birth, the pulmonary blood flow is roughly uh, twice that of the systemic blood flow, but with a significant amount of variability. We're going to get to some other parts about this uh, in just a second. I don't know with the bandwidth whether this type of circulation is coming through appropriately or not, but what I've tried to show here is the red blood cells on the pulmonary side and the desaturated blue cells on the systemic side that happens after birth. But fortunately, many babies uh, will have a PFO or even a naturally occurring atrial septal defect. And as we talked about before, there's equal volume of mixing in both directions across that atrial hole. So in a baby that has just atrial level shunting and the volume of blood from one side to the other is exactly equal in both directions, we actually have a pretty stable circulation where we have atrial mixing alone, there's no significant volume load early on to either side. There's no symptomatic congestive heart failure. There is significant hypoxemia. So it's not uncommon that we have a very happy baby, but very unhappy doctors and nurses, especially now that we can see a pulse oximetry rate, uh, range of about uh, 60 or 65%. And as Dr. Seed, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that's uh, probably better than they were in utero. However, in our current day and age, because we have the technology to treat this, what normally will happen, I'm sure in most of your institutions, is the recommendation to start prostaglandin. So once prostaglandin gets started, and I'll give you a, a sort of cartoon evaluation like that at the bottom, there will be a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery shown there as a blue arrow with a red line around it. And the volume that, that goes from blue to pink will be equal to the volume that goes from pink to blue in the atrium. We can show that here. Again, uh, trying to circulate the red blood cells here, what ends up happening now is we have a left to right atrial shunt and an aorta to pulmonary artery shunt. The oxygen saturation is, quote, better. I hear that term frequently. But we now have a heart that's volume overloaded and eventually a baby that will develop heart failure from a large ductus arteriosus. Um, this is some data on the left that we took from the bedside monitor of a baby where the baby had low oxygen saturations and on the bottom line is the oxygen saturation. Uh, the middle three lines are the systolic mean and diastolic blood pressure and the top line is heart rate. The decision was made to start prostaglandin. And you could see on the purple line right about where the ductus opened there and got the oxygen saturations up to about 90%. That made some people happy. Um, the pulse pressure going along with an open ductus began to widen and the heart rate slowly began to increase. So the cost, so to speak, of a higher oxygen saturation is the potential for congestive heart failure, a wide pulse pressure, tachycardia, perhaps abnormal flow to the brain, and hopefully Mike will touch base a little bit on this postnatally. And as we see in the premature infant and why we're asked to close ductuses frequently is because of the systemic steel, organ oxygen delivery may be decreased even though the pulse oximetry reading is increased. And I think we need to study this just a bit more. I for personally in the ICU, I love to see kids whose heart rates come down and blood pressures go up. Uh, and for that reason, I am generally more tolerant of lower oxygen saturations in transposition. 
But I have to say, most intensivists do not like to stop prostaglandin. And there's a, a lot of discussion, as you might imagine, in our intensive care unit, uh, as well as probably all of yours, I find this to be inversely proportional to age. Another thing I hear in the intensive care unit is the baby is stable on a prostaglandin infusion. And that's the big myth. The baby is not stable in, on prostaglandin. The reality is the baby is going to go into heart failure on a prostaglandin infusion. Um, and I've heard people say prostaglandin is bad because it gives tissue edema and all that stuff. Actually, what is not good physiology is a wide open ductus arteriosus, especially in diastole. There could be low cerebral oxygen delivery and gut oxygen delivery. Uh, surgeons, many surgeons have told me that there's tissue friability when a baby's on prostin for a while. It's probably not the prostin, but the fluid retention due to heart failure. But prostaglandin can also have its problems with hypotension, apnea, fever, and rashes. So let's talk about the one situation that I think we worry about the most, and that's the patients with intact atrial septum. They're hypoxemic. They get started on a ductus arteriosus, which results in an aorta to pulmonary artery shunt, as you could see here at the bottom. But then as this blood returns to the left atrium, there's nowhere for it to go. And the patients end up with uh, profound acidosis, profound hypoxemia and shock. And it's not because the prostaglandin is bad or the ductus shouldn't be open, but because there's no way to get the red blood from the pulmonary veins to the aorta. And we've probably all seen cases like this where the x-ray is highly congested. It could be obstructed total pulmonary veins or mitral atresia. It's all the same physiology. You need to get red blood from the pulmonary veins to the aorta. And we don't have many options as an intensivist to deal with this. The only way to really uh, get this any better, in my opinion, is to call on Lee Benson and his colleagues in the cath lab and say, we need an open atrial septum as soon as possible. In the meantime, and I'll uh, share this toward the end, there are a couple of things that we can do to make the baby um, as stable as possible before the atrial hole is made. How do we think about dealing with persistent hypoxemia despite a good atrial septostomy or prior to the atrial septostomy? Well, we have these options. Uh, we can put a baby on ECMO, we can put a baby on bypass and do the arterial switch. But one other way to think about this is to think about, uh, hold on, I'm just gonna check my timer real quickly, uh, is to think about what we could do on the mixed venous side. So again, this is a picture that we had uh, put together uh, in our book chapter a long while ago uh, where I showed you the QP to QS ratio. But this is yet another example. We're using the term ratio is not helpful at all because what we wanna know about in this disease is the effective pulmonary blood flow. What do we mean by effective pulmonary blood flow? Well, first of all, you could see it's only a fraction of the total pulmonary blood flow, usually in the range of about a quarter. Um, if we try to get an idea of the way this looks um, uh, from at least a figure perspective, if we imagine that our systemic on the left and pulmonary on the right blood flow is circulating around and around and around, none of that blood contributes to gas exchange. It's only the red blood that gets to the systemic side that delivers oxygen. And it's only the blue blood that gets to the pulmonary side that eliminates CO2. So those red and blue arrows are what we would call the effective flow. And the QP effective or the effective pulmonary blood flow is the portion of the total pulmonary blood flow that contributes to gas exchange at the capillary level. Increasing flow in and of itself may not help us. We have to increase effective flow. The majority of the total flow is ineffective, as you can see here. And similarly, because we know those numbers are exactly the same, the systemic blood flow that's effective is only the blood that gets from the pulmonary veins to the aorta. The majority of it is ineffective. So what can we do as intensivists? Well, what we can do is we can make that blue blood, the ineffective blood, as pink as possible, meaning we have to increase the mixed venous oxygen saturation. This is the only tool we have in the intensive care unit. And the only way we can increase the mixed venous oxygen saturation is to decrease the consumption of oxygen peripherally, 
or increase the delivery of oxygen from the myocardium. And we're all familiar with those ways, which would include decreasing consumption, avoiding fever, sedation. Tell your neonatologist, please, or if there's any neonatologist on here, we've gotten far away from using neuromuscular blockade in preemies, but single doses of neuromuscular blockade can reduce oxygen consumption by at least 20%. And you can get another five to 10 points in oxygen saturation. Um, we have tried inotropic support and transfusion. Um, but again, the only thing that really matters is you don't mix from the ductus. More prostin doesn't help. You need an atrial hole. The only way to get these babies stable is to get blood from the left atrium to the aorta. And I hope that's your takeaway from this talk. Really, the only thing that we can do is you have to have an atrial level shunt. Even in babies with transposition VSD, blood does not like to go uphill from the low resistance LV into the high resistance systemic circulation. Um, the, other, the last thing I'll mention uh, about this is the, the fear I have of stroke in these babies. And, and Lee may mention this talking about the, uh, the atrial septostomies. But any systemic, uh, any vein has the potential of putting gas or particulate matter uh, into the uh, systemic circulation, which then can go to the brain. So some of you may see this potential problem here uh, in a series of IVs, and nurses do the best they can to get rid of these things. But these little air bubbles or particulate things can go right from vein to brain. As we talked about, the majority of the blood flow is recirculated. So leaving a baby with transposition physiology is not a good idea. Transposition is surgical heart disease. An open PDA is not necessarily a good thing. Um, it's probably bad for you. We like to keep kids on prostin. In fact, we were having a discussion about a case this morning at my own institution about the timing of a baby that was born yesterday who's, quote, doing well on prostin should we let him recover. So I'm gonna quote my good friend um, and colleague, John Berger, who, uh, who I've had the pleasure to work with for two and a half years now. And uh, he has said, you cannot treat surgical heart disease with medicine. Remember that transposition physiology is tricky, it's unpredictable, and it's potentially dangerous. However, an arterial switch operation is good. It takes blue blood to the brain and makes it red blood. And as I've shown at the wonderful meeting in Taramina last year, it can take a blue Dr. Agati and make him into a pink Dr. Sasha Agati. I think that's all the time that I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions through the, uh, the chat room. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, of course, thanks to be, make me pink. And uh, we go to the next uh, presentation. As you say, we need uh, Dr. Benson, who is a staff interventional cardiologist from uh, Sick Children Hospital in uh, Toronto. If you stop to share your screen, Gil, we can uh, we can ask to. Oh, my bad, sorry. Yes, we can ask to. Yes, if uh, uh, Lee, if you want to share your screen, is the moment. Yes. Can you see? can you see? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So I I like to thank the Congenital Heart Academy for the kind invitation to talk about balloon atrial septostomy. I, I like to speak initially in a historical context. Um, this is really the first true clinically applicable interventional procedure now 55 years old, uh, as described by Dr. Rashkin in his landmark 1966 paper, which is, very, which is uh, the technique very effective in uh, relieving hypoxia and uh, decreasing uh, oxygen requirements. Uh, on the bottom left side is a line diagram from one of his early papers describing the technique. Um, importantly, uh, the um, a chart uh, next to it is a, a life table from the hospital for sick children uh, taken in uh, the late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, defining the impact of balloon septostomy on um, the life of a child with transposition, uh, demonstrating that um, demonstrating that uh, 
by doing a balloon septostomy alone, it allowed the child to survive um, as opposed to the uh, natural history of the disease. And this was important because uh, mustard's operation, the atrial switch operation at the time, uh, was best performed when the child was six months of age. So uh, it was important to uh, do some maneuver uh, that would um, uh, improve oxygenation and survival. Uh, the blaylock hanlon operation in the 1950s uh, was around, but it had a high mortality, uh, and it was a technically difficult operation for the surgeons. I, I remember speaking with Dr. Rashkin oh, some 40 years ago about how he came out deciding to um, uh, perform or to describe this uh, way of creating an atrial defect. And he, he, he told me that he, in, the, in his reading of Dr. Tausig's uh, congenital malformations of the heart textbook, he was um, um, inspired by the clinical observation that she had made that uh, transposition uh, with an atrial septal defect had a much la longer um, uh, lifespan than uh, those uh, without. So what are the indications for an atrial septostomy? Um, uh, Gil sort of laid the groundwork for the uh, physiologic basics. It, it's a class one indication um, to enhance atrial mixing. Uh, the physiology uh, uh, was well described. Uh, the procedure itself, the equipment, um, uh, there's now two uh, balloon septostomy catheters uh, uh, available uh, that can be used. Uh, axis site is from the femoral or umbilical vein. Uh, this is an old picture, uh, but it describes the um, uh, technique that's done. Uh, it's very unusual now to have to take the uh, patient uh, to the cardiac catheterization laboratory to actually do the procedure. Uh, today, uh, inevitably, it's done at the child's bedside in the intensive care unit uh, under echo guidance. And it's performed by a single jerky motion. Uh, I remember Dr. Ryashkin telling us that it really... Um, requires two jerks, uh, one holding the end of the catheter. Dr. Reskin is a very funny guy. Um, it's not risk-free. There are risks and complications, balloon rupture, uh, air getting into the circulation, as alluded to by Gill, embolization of balloon fragments, which is very unusual, as is the uh, rare event of the inability to deflate the balloon, uh, misjudgment of the position of the balloon in the atrial septum, uh, a cardiac perforation, particularly if there is juxtaposed atrial appendages, uh, an issue that is less um, evident today under echo guidance and, of course, mitral valve injury. There can be vascular injury, as you can imagine, in the pulmonary vein. Uh, the femoral artery can actually be uh, damaged. Uh, these babies are very hypoxic, uh, and cannulation of a femoral vessel, uh, one may think they're in the vein when they're in the artery, uh, and the placement of a large sheath can uh, traumatize the vessel. Uh, and of course, there is the uh, risk of avulsion or tear of the IVC uh, with a very aggressive um, uh, pullback of the device. And there are higher complications rate, rates uh, documented if the procedure is performed out of hours, uh, usually because these children are, are, are very, very ill and unstable. And then finally, embolic complications such as stroke uh, may be encountered. And this clearly has uh, impact on uh, neural development of the child and has generated a great deal of uh, controversy uh, about the use of balloon atrial septostomy. So I just want to go over some of the data about um, uh, stroke uh, with um, this procedure. Now, the, uh, one of the original articles uh, from uh, Quinlan and Steve Miller uh, talking about the uh, risk of uh, stroke uh, in um, a group of patients with transposition. Uh, they looked at 29 newborns with um, uh, preoperative MRIs and found 41% uh, or 12 patients having um, a stroke. These uh, were pre-op ischemic strokes. They were focal, they were multi, uh, in multiple locations. Uh, and they were with various combinations of wall motion abnormalities. All of these patients had balloon atrial septostomies. 
but there were some confounding variables, all had low systemic um, oxygenation, and they were unable to identify any effect of the axis site. For example, um, a, a clot, if you were doing an umbilical venous uh, cannulation and the ductus venosus was uh, uh, closed and had a thrombus in it, they couldn't find a pattern of global hypoxia uh, on the MRI scans, and they had no effect of the degree of neonatal illness severity uh, accounting for the uh, observations on the MRI. The most recent review of this kind of, of um, uh, lesion uh, is uh, this April uh, from uh, Hamza, uh, from our registry data uh, base, uh, looking at 1,700 babies with transposition over a 16-year uh, period, a quarter of them having blue natal septostomy, having a septostomy versus those not having a septostomy was the same, uh, although there was a higher mortality and a need for ECMO in patients who had no septostomy performed. And they did observe uh, a higher incidence of clinical stroke uh, in 1.1% uh, uh, of the balloon atrial septostomy patients, but they were unable from the database, the registry database, to uh, identify the timing of the stroke. Uh, the patients with, um, who required a septostomy were in hospital a bit longer, perhaps reflecting that these patients were more profoundly hypoxemic uh, and were uh, 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 in, well, unstable uh, going into their uh, surgery and, and therefore uh, accounted in part for um, uh, their uh, long hospital stay. Um, another paper uh, that I thought was of interest uh, was uh, from uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and uh, these authors uh, looked at 44 babies uh, before uh, surgery with preoperative MRIs, but uh, they were unable to identify any um, association between septostomy and brain injury, whether that be uh, uh, white matter injury or stroke. Um, they did identify white matter injury in 30% of the patients with septostomies, but also 18% of the patients without, uh, and a very low incidence of stroke in the population and no risk factors for injury identified, uh, either the root of balloon atrial septostomy, illness severity, the degree of hypoxia or oxygen delivery. Uh, I put that little video up in the corner. I, I, as an interventional cardiologist, I'm trying to be unbiased, but I do remember when you go to a when you go to a barber, you do get a haircut. So uh, it's uh, tried to be uh, a level playing field. Uh, the last paper I just want to mention uh, from uh, Chop, uh, I think Gil was the third author on this paper. Uh, Chris Pettit uh, looked at twenty six patients with transposition again preoperative MRIs, um, uh, half going and having un undertaken a blue natural septostomy. No strokes were observed. Uh, 10 were found to have hypoxic brain injury in the form of white matter uh, injury or what was termed periventricular leukomalacia, but it was not associated with uh, balloon atrial septostomies. What was observed, which was uh, interesting, uh, was that the neonates with the uh, lo lowest preoperative saturation and the longest uh, preoperative uh, desaturation uh, had the highest incidence of uh, white matter uh, injury. And they also observed that the longer times to surgery um, were also associated with um, um, uh, brain injury. Uh, again, uh, something that was alluded to uh, in uh, Gil's uh, description. So what can we say about the decision to perform a balloon atrial septostomy? Taking the patient population, unrestrictive ASD, preductal saturations, say 80, 85%. Uh, if the baby is extubate, uh, intubated, extubate the child and look for a trial of prostaglandins and to see if they maintain a reasonable uh, oxygen saturation. What The patient who presents with an, a restrictive ASD, you can call that a two or three millimeter defect, very arbitrary, a mean Doppler gradient greater than four or five millimeters, arbitrary, low preductal sats on prostaglandins. I guess if the patient is acidotic, much more motivating to perform the procedure if they're 
not acidotic. Uh, sometimes there's a, com a conversation about the appropriateness of um, uh, creating an atrial defect. We don't uh, take that uh, standard. Uh, we uh, intubate the babies, um, paralyze them, and perform the procedure. However, uh, with the therapeutic goal of reducing the time uh, to uh, uh, of having a low uh, systemic saturation. But there are some caveats. If the child is intubated and paralyzed, sometimes it's very difficult to make the, de the decision because their oxygen saturations can improve dramatically, again, as alluded to by Gil, uh, with the maneuvers in the unit. Uh, and there is a certain institutional preference which impacts uh, the decision-making. The timing to the operating room, and I think um, Mike will uh, address this, uh, the timing of the, to the operating room, if it's gonna be in two or three days, maybe there's no imperative to uh, perform a procedure, but if it's gonna be in a week, or there's the possibility that may be delayed, it can become an issue uh, in management. And then there's the desire to stop the prostaglandins, to avoid the complications while on an open ward perhaps, apnea, fever, GI issues, the impact on clotting, tissue edema uh, due to the uh, medication, a lower diastolic blood pressure, all of which uh, affect the physiology uh, of the child. And then finally, uh, it's um, uh, as you follow a large number of patients through uh, with transposition who are placed on prostaglandins and then have a septostomy, about a third of these babies will require reinstitution of the prostaglandins because of uh, falling saturations. And this may be due to a low left atrial pressure, pulmonary hypertension, and the fact that the prostaglandins has a certain um, pulmonary vasodilator um, uh, impact. Uh, there may be a gender um, uh, impact, uh, genetic impact, and of course, there's been some observation on the duration of the use of prostaglandins before the septostomy um, is performed. So in summary, balloon atrial septostomy creates a non-restrictive atrial communication, optimizing atrial level mixing, improving systemic oxygen saturation, PO2, cardiac output, and lowers the left atrial pressure. Uh, the technique is the single most important factor in improving survival in babies with transposition prior to uh, surgical correction. The predominance of uh, uh, evidence would suggest that the most profoundly hypoxic babies uh, who have a balloon atrial septostomy are indeed the ones who are at the highest risk of uh, um, uh, brain um, white matter injury. Uh, and the mechanisms of these injuries are complex. Um, inflammation, hypoxia, ischemia, brain maturity, et cetera. And as such, uh, improvement in the degree of hypoxia uh, may, in fact, reduce the risk of a white matter injury and uh, better the neurodevelopmental milestones of the children. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Gil, are you there or are you answer to the chat? A lot of very interesting questions on the chat and on the question and answers as well. Gil is not there, so we will go. We go to the next speaker again uh, from uh, Sea Kids from Toronto. The the colleague uh, Mike is a very. Uh, it means uh, the, one of the last uh, paper coming from his center. And uh, he will talk to us about the optimal timing of uh, the arterial switch. Thank you, Mike. If you can share your, I Mike, before you uh, before you pick up your slides, as you might imagine, there's been a, a ton of questions about timing in the chat. Uh, so very, I think this is going to be very timely. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. Timely talk uh, for. Uh, uh, the, the multiple questions that I've tried to answer in the chat. And Lee, thanks for your talk. The one comment I'd also want to make is there's so many other ways besides the septostomy that kids can have stroke. Um, uh, and maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Yes. Well, hello. Um, thank you very I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to talk about the timing of the arterial switch operation.
I don't have any disclosures except to say that the question of when the arterial switch should be done is not one our group has ever set out to answer. Rather, it's an issue that has become a subject of interest during our research into neurodevelopmental outcomes in patients with transposition. And so I'd like to start by showing you the results of our study uh, of brain injury and perioperative brain growth in patients undergoing an arterial switch at our hospital over recent years, and then circle back to the broader question of what the optimal timing might be for performing the operation. We used pre and post-operative brain MRI and neurodevelopmental testing at 18 months to look for clinical risk factors for adverse developmental outcomes in 45 infants with uh, transposition with or without a VSD. On preoperative imaging, we observed similar findings to those that have been reported by prior studies, including evidence of brain injury in a third of our babies. The majority of these were white matter injuries, like the one shown in air. It's had a small stroke, like the one shown in the thalamus uh, in B. Several patients had intraventricular hemorrhage, like the one shown in D. And most patients did not show any progression of brain injury on postoperative imaging. Although one baby that developed uh, sinus thrombosis uh, around uh, a secondary to a neckline clot uh, developed seizures and had evidence of venous infarction in both thalami as shown in C. We assessed brain growth by measuring brain volume using MRI, which we converted to brain weight Z scores based on reference autopsy data. Most of the patients showed a slowing of brain growth between the pre and post-operative scan. While we didn't identify any clinical risk factors for pre or post-operative brain injury, we found two risk factors for impaired perioperative brain growth, which were the presence of a ventricular septal defect and older age at surgery. The latter is illustrated by this plot of post-operative brain size Z-score and against age of at repair. In Toronto, we've traditionally delayed the arterial switch operation by six to eight weeks in patients with a large BSD and reasonable oxygen saturations. And this is reflected by this plot showing the number of patients operated by age. As you can see, there's an early peak at six to seven days, mostly consisting of patients with transposition with intact septum while well, patients operated later often had VSDs. Based on this distribution, we divided the patients into an early group operated in the first two weeks and a late group operated at more than two weeks of age. These plots compare brain weight Z score on the post-operative scan in the early and late groups and in the intact septum versus ventricular septal defect groups illustrating the more significant deficit in brain growth in patients undergoing later repair and in those with a VSD. One possible explanation for impaired preoperative brain growth in babies with transposition is arterial desaturation. Cerebral blood flow can be measured with phase contrast MRI and in newborns with a range of cyanotic congenital heart malformations, including, including 13 babies with transposition, we found that although cerebral blood flow was preserved compared with normal controls, cyanosis resulted in a reduction in cerebral oxygen delivery. Another factor that may play a role in impaired brain growth in infants with transposition is pulmonary overcirculation. Patients with unrepaired TGA with open ducts and large interatrial communications typically have shunts in the three to one range, but may have shunts as high as six to one. And while even in the face of very high pulmonary blood flow, cerebral autoregulation seems to preserve cerebral blood flow, there's clearly an effect on blood flow to the lower body, which presumably affects gut perfusion. And so feed intolerance and the resulting poor nutrition may have an impact on brain growth. As you can see, blood flow to the lower body normalizes following repair. Similarly, brain growth trajectory also picks up 
following repair. The neurodevelopmental test results from our study revealed scores within the normal range in all of our subjects. However, the scores were all lower for the late repair group, and we found negative associations between language score and age at surgery, as shown by the plot on the right, as well as language score and, and days of open chest. A length of stay was also negatively associated with cognitive outcomes. Our results are in keeping with the findings of the Boston Circulatory Arrest Study, in which the transposition patients with VSDs who were repaired on average 11 days later than those with intact ventricular septum had more evidence of brain injury on perioperative EEG and postoperative neurologic testing and early neurodevelopment testing. Interestingly, these early markers of neurologic abnormality translated into cognitive impairments when these children were older which were most significant in patients with a combination of a VSD and circulatory arrest. Another transposition cohort, this time from New York, that underwent a battery of psychological testing in early adulthood, revealed a similar degree of mild neurocognitive impairment and anxiety. In this study, the presence of a VSD was actually protective against depressive symptoms in adulthood, while older age surgery was one of several factors that was associated with poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes and mental health issues. It would appear then that earlier surgery may be neuroprotective in patients with transposition. But what is the impact of timing of surgery on overall outcomes? Well, the answer to that question likely depends on era. It's worth considering how far we've come since the early days of the arterial switch, when mortality was more than 20% at centres that were starting to perform the operation, as was elegantly shown by Catherine Bull and her colleagues at Great Ormond Street. Subsequent data from the same centre shows that 20 years ago, arterial switches were often performed much later than they are today, and with very good results. Although patients were more likely to die or require ECMO for a deconditioned left ventricle when operated after 28 days of age. By 2004, centres like the Cleveland Clinic were reporting excellent survival for the arterial switch, which was generally being performed in the first two weeks in patients with transposition with an intact ventricular septum. Patients with more complex anatomy were being repaired later, also with very low mortality, although about 25% were needing reintervention. By 2014, Many centres, including Columbia, were reporting large series with mortality of less than 2% and homing in on the relationship between timing of surgery and, the perioper and perioperative morbidity and the cost of care. This data suggests that the sweet spot for the arterial switch operation in patients with transposition with or without a VSD is around three days of age. However, this study from Michigan looking at outcomes in patients needing neonatal surgery for either single ventricle palliation or obstructed pulmonary blood flow, as well as arterial switch operations, showed that younger age of surgery was actually associated with higher mortality in newborns requiring a systemic to pulmonary artery shunt, with a similar trend for transposition. So in contrast with the results reported by Columbia, older age at surgery did not negatively impact perioperative morb morbidity. Recent data from the Pediatric Health Information Systems database for more than 2,000 infants undergoing the arterial switch at 40 North American centers revealed there's still some variation in the median age at arterial switch. Although most centers are performing the operation during the first 10 days, High volume centers tend to do their switches earlier, and this is associated with a small survival advantage. 
Although other factors like prematurity in the presence of a genetic syndrome are more important determinants of outcome. So to summarize, outcomes following the arterial switch are now spectacularly good. And when the ventricular septum is intact, the operation is usually done in the first 10 days. There seem then to be two distinct approaches when there's a large VSD. While some centers operate early, as they would for transposition with intact septum, others prefer to delay the surgery for a few weeks. While there may be valid surgical reasons for delaying definitive repair, our impression is that this may have an impact on neurodevelopment through a combination of ischemic injuries and impaired brain growth, probably as a result of excessive pulmonary blood flow and or cerebral hypoxemia. And to emphasize this point, I'd just like to leave you with this normal growth chart, which shows how in contrast with somatic growth, which continues steadily for 18 years or more, the first few months of life are associated with a very rapid period of brain growth, such that in normal children, 75% So it's perhaps not surprising that brain development may be, may be particularly susceptible to disruption as a result of the abnormal cardiovascular physiology associated with unrepaired transposition. In the middle is data published by Jane Newberger in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1984, showing the relationship between age at atrial switch and IQ in children with transposition which shows so clearly what a positive impact timely surgical repair has on neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so I'd like to finish by thanking you for your attention and expressing what a great honor it is for me to be representing Sick Kids, where Bill Mustard was our chief of cardiac surgery from 1957 to 1976. Um, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce a, a longtime friend. I don't like to say old friends anymore, Merrill, but a longtime friend uh, and superb pediatric cardiologist uh, at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She's, she's held many titles, um, director of the Echo Lab and uh, director of the fellowship program. And I'm really glad that she'll be sharing her thoughts with us today on preoperative imaging. Thanks, Merrill. Can you see my slides, Gil? Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to thank Sasha and Grace and Gil for inviting me to this extraordinary session. Um, it's remarkable to see how many people uh, are, are on this uh, webinar, and um, I'm very pleased to be a part of it. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about imaging. And uh, as you heard from Professor Anderson, uh, transposition is a ventricular arterial assignment. It is also, as you heard from Gil, uh, a physiologic state. Uh, and we're talking today about patients who have atrioventricular concordance with ventricular arterial discordance. And then if uh, you have situs solidus, that's a D-looped heart, if you're using Ven Pragge in terms, and mirror image, the L-looped heart. And we do distinguish between simple and complex transposition in that in the simple form, you have generally an intact ventricular septum or very small VSD and in complex form, you have large amalaligned or multiple ventricular septal defects. <clears throat> and we know, and you're going to hear about some of the surgeries that are performed, the arterial switch with or without the Lecompte in patients who have an intact ventricular septum or small VSDs. Uh, the Restelli or the Nakaido procedure is performed when there is a posterior malalignment ventricular septal defect in association with pulmonary outflow tract obstruction. And then uh, in the patient who has an anterior malalignment VSD, there is a very complex repair that includes the arterial switch operation. And then of course, <clears throat> in patients who have late diagnosis, we may choose to perform uh, an atrial switch in that venue. Of course, we want to know all the information about the patient prior to surgery, uh, but I wanna highlight uh, specific areas uh, particular to transposition of the great arteries. And this is, of course, uh, the atrial communication, as you've heard about, uh, the atrioventricular valves, 
Uh, we'll talk about the VSD, the type, the size, and the number, uh, infundibular morphology, outflow tract obstruction, aortic uh, and pulmonary artery relationship, and then arch and PD, patent ductus arteriosus, and then, of course, coronary artery anatomy. In 2016, we put out a multimodality uh, guideline for transposition of the great arteries, uh, and this is just a list of the various views we use in order to make determination of various aspects of the anatomy. And what I can say is that echocardiography is generally the only modality required for pre-surgical evaluation. And so in that protocol, uh, we particularly in our institution start in the sub xiphoid view. And here's a list of, of the variety of things that we can see uh, using this view, including particularly the atrial septum and diagnosing juxtaposition of the atrial appendages if it exists. We can often tell VSD type, we can enumerate the uh, aorta to pulmonary artery relationship and assess infundibular anatomy. The apical view, of course, for ventricular size and function and AV valve function and anatomy. We can also see the outflow tracts by sweeping anteriorly as well as semilunar valve function. Some people start in the parasternal view and we can also use that to assess uh, um, assigning the great arteries as well as see the parallel relationship that we typically see in association with uh, transposition of the great arteries. And then AV valves and infundibular anatomy. The high parasternal view is used to assess the coronary anatomy. Uh, and then of course, suprasternal for arch and ductus arteriosus. And transposition is uh, what I would say an instantaneous diagnosis. You can make one sweep of the heart and know that the patient indeed has transposition. And here you see a sub xiphoid sweep, and you can do this either in sub xiphoid or parasternal long axis view, and you can instantly see the atrial septum and know if the atrial communication is uh, large enough. You can assign or see the assignment of the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle here, and then the aorta arising anteriorly assigned I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, pulmonary artery to the left ventricle and, a, or, and uh, the aorta to the right ventricle. It also helps us assess the orientation of the great arteries. Here you see the pulmonary artery is posterior and to the left of the aorta. And it, we can even get hints about the coronary arteries. And in general, in transposition of the great arteries with intact ventricular septum, you see this very uh, parallel circulation of the great arteries, which, which you can see in almost any sub typhoid view. If you do start with parasternal long axis view, the diagnosis can also be made very quickly. The great arteries are seen diving posteriorly in parallel, and this is also an excellent view to assess the left ventricular outflow tract, which often has obstruction. In the apical view, we can highlight the inflows. We can assess the semilunar valves. Again, you can see the relationship of the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Here you see the pulmonary artery arising from the left ventricle, the aorta from the, left vent from the right ventricle. You can assess ventricular performance, and we can even get hints about abnormal coronary artery patterns. Uh, restrictive atrial communications can be identified quite quickly uh, by transthoracic echocardiography. Um, it, it, usually we know quite quickly that there's a problem because the PO2 is uh, quite low in these patients and this can help usher the patient to get a balloon atrial septostomy. I will tell you that it can occasionally be tricky to tell if there's an atrial communication or not. Here's a recent patient of ours who actually had no atrial communication whatsoever. This was an aneurysm of the septum primum and so the atrial septum was being pushed uh, from the, the flow from the left atrium, but in fact, there was no crossing over of flow and the patient still required a septo atrial septostomy. An atrial septostomy can be performed at the bedside. Uh, the advantages of that is no radiation. You don't have to move the patient from the intensive care unit. And here you see the balloon uh, across at the left atrium and then you sort of lose it for a second and see it pop up again on the right atrial side and then you can um, very quickly determine uh, if the uh, atrial septostomy has been effective. This can all be done in the sub xiphoid view under the drapes as the catheter, um, catheterization is being performed in the ICU. 
Professor Anderson touched about, upon ventricular septal defects in the setting of transposition, and they are similar to the types of ventricular septal defects we see in patients with normally related great arteries. About 40 to 45 percent of children with transposition have a ventricular septal defect, and it can be any of these types, perimembranous, outlet, outlet with malalignment. Inlet defects are pretty unusual, except in isomerism, and then muscular defects. And then, of course, if there is malalignment of the infundibular septum with the ventricular septum, we will see outflow tract obstruction in those settings. So ventricular septal defects add complexity to the surgery and often have a higher rate of reintervention. And patients who have malalignment type VSDs, um, that will often dictate the type of surgery that is performed. One thing I really do want to emphasize is that we often perform echocardiography within the first hour after a baby with transposition is born, either because we know the prenatal diagnosis or because they are cyanotic. And in those instances when the pulmonary vascular resistance is still high, there's limited shunting. And so VSDs can be missed if you only echo the patient very soon after their birth, particularly perimembranous defects and perimembranous VSD. You can see in the subxiphoid view here and the parasternal long axis view here that the direction of flow is from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. Again, I want to emphasize that it can be missed early on. And so I would uh, um, suggest that any patient who is imaged in the first few hours of life should have uh, imaging again prior to surgery, either in the operating room with transesophageal imaging or uh, just a glance at the ventricular septum again before they go to the operating room. As Professor Anderson um, mentioned, an outlet or juxta arterial ventricular septal defect where the infundibular septum is hypoplastic or absent is somewhat unusual in this setting, but here you see this very fibrous rim uh, between the two great arteries. You can see that the aorta and the pulmonary valve are at the same level. Um, and the reason why it is important to know this is because the surgeon may approach it differently. And because there is not muscle between the two outflows, um, the surgery can damage the semilunar valves in trying to uh, close the VSDs. With posterior malalignment VSD, the infundibular septum is directed towards the left ventricle. Um, and in this particular cohort of patients, the aorta tends to be anterior to the pulmonary artery. Here you see the infundibular septum, and this orange is the ventricular septum, so it shows you that relationship. Um, if the pulmonary outflow tract is small, these patients uh, usually cannot undergo an arterial switch operation. And so the echocardiogram is required to assess the severity of pulmonary obstruction. But keep in mind, if the ductus arterios arteriosus is wide open or it's early on, the patient may have no gradient across the pulmonary outflow right away. We we use sort of the pulmonary annulus size as a surrogate to tell us if there's going to be obstruction. We can assess the size of the ventricular septal defect and determine if the patient is a candidate for Rostelli or Nakaido. And here you see this infundibular septum tipped into uh, the left ventricular uh, outflow tract, um, and you can see it here as well. You can see the mitral to pulmonary continuity here, fibrous continuity, and you can see that the pulmonary outflow in this setting is quite small compared to the aortic. With anterior malalignment, the infundibular septum tends to be directed rightward, um, which you can see here in green. So again, here's the ventricular septum, and here's the infundibular septum in this relationship. And in this setting, the aorta tends to be more side by side with the pulmonary artery. These patients can undergo a complex arterial switch operation which may require an arch repair if the aorta is small, if the patient has coarctation or interrupted uh, interruption of the aortic arch. Uh, and in some cases, the aortic outflow is so small that they may require a right ventricular outflow tract augmentation at the time of the arterial switch, similar to patients who have tetralogy of flow. 
So again, we need to assess the severity of the aortic outflow obstruction, which includes the size of the aortic annulus and the subaortic region, and then arch must always be assessed. Here is a sub view where you see that the infundibular septum has become an RV structure from this malalignment. You can see the side-by-side -side grade arteries and the aorta is smaller than the pulmonary artery. And here in this apical five-chamber view is another example. Infundibular septum is malaligned. The aorta and pulmonary artery are, are in parallel. Professor Anderson discussed uh, the variations of pulmonary outflow tract obstructions and in the limits of time, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see a variety of ways that you can have that obstruction here. And echocardiography can essentially diagnose all of them. Here is an example of a mitral valve attachment to the uh, sep ventricular septum causing obstruction to the pulmonary artery. Here's an example of tricuspid valve uh, aneurysmal tissue in the way of the pulmonary outflow. And here uh, you see a subpulmonary ridge in the parasternal long axis view. Professor Anderson also described the alignment of the commissures of the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And you can see that typically they are in alignment as you see here. Uh, however, sometimes they are misaligned and again, that may affect the ability of the surgeon to transfer the coronaries because it takes a longer distance to get there. These are uh, um, you can, recognized in the high parasternal view. That view is also used to help us assess great artery position. You can have uh, the aorta anterior and to the right of the pulmonary artery, which is the most common relationship we see of these great arteries. They can be side by side. And if the great arteries are side by side, you're more likely to see coronary artery variants. The aorta can be directly anterior to the pulmonary artery. It can be rarely to the left of the coronary artery. And that, that is uh, often associated with hypoplasia of the right ventricle. And uh, as Professor Anderson alluded to, the aorta can be posterior to the pulmonary artery, and this is exquisitely rare. I'm going to briefly go through the coronary variants in transposition. Um, as Professor Anderson said, you can describe them how, however you choose, but the echocardiographer and the surgeon should be on the same page of how they are described. We describe them as left-facing and right-facing, but you can also do sinus one and sinus two, as Professor Anderson talked about. And so uh, approximately two-thirds of patients have the usual coronary uh, anatomy where the left coronary is arising from the left-facing and the right from the right-facing. But the most common anomaly is circumflex from the right, where you can see the coronary ar artery crossing, uh, the, the circumflex crossing posterior to the pulmonary artery. You can have variations of single right and single left coronary arteries. And the very unusual inverted coronary arteries where the coronaries are arising from the opposite facing sinus. So the right coronary artery comes from the left facing sinus and the left coronary artery comes from the right facing sinus. And this causes the so-called double looping where you see a coronary crossing anterior to the aorta or po and posterior to the pulmonary artery. In some very rare cases, fortunately, you can have the coronary crossing between the great arteries, and that is called an intramural course. It can course in the wall uh, of the aorta, and this can be very problematic for the arterial switch. And so why do these coronary artery anatomy issues matter? Because failed coronary transfer is the primary cause of poor outcome after the arterial switch. And it is highly associated with coronary artery anatomy, as had been shown by Sarah Pasquale's uh, paper many years ago with intramural coronary having six and a half times the risk for mortality compared to other variants. And there have been a lot of data to suggest that there can be long-term issues from coron original coronary artery anatomy as well. We assess the coronaries by the high parasternal view using uh, uh, angulation. Here's the right coming from the right facing sinus, the left from the left facing sinus. So this is the usual coronary anatomy. Some helpful hints for the echocardiographers on this uh, call about how to assure you can tell coronary artery uh, issues. If a coronary artery is crossing posterior to the pulmonary artery, and this is seen well in sub-xiphoid and apical views, 
It's either the circumflex from the right, a single right coronary artery, or an inverted left coronary artery. If a coronary artery is crossing anterior to the aorta, which is also seen well from subxiphoid and high parasternal views, it's either a single left coronary artery or an inverted right coronary artery. And of course, if you see it crossing between the great arteries, best seen in the high parasternal view, then it has an intramural course. Here you see a single left coronary artery. You can see the right coronary artery is crossing anterior to the aorta here. You see the LAD and the CERC also arising. And then here you see some examples of circumflex coming posterior uh, to the pulmonary artery and passing just behind the pulmonary artery in the apical four chamber view. This is a beautiful specimen from Diane Spicer showing an intramural course of the left coronary artery making its way through um, and coursing through the wall of the aorta. You can actually see the intramural segment here. And here are examples uh, of intramural course. Here you see the coronary artery co coursing between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and you can see the flow here between the two, branch, the two great arteries as well. The arch and the um, ductus arteriosus are best seen in the suprasternal sagittal view, again, because of that parallel um, course of the great arteries. They sort of sit on top of each other, and this can make it quite challenging when the uh, PDA is quite large. And sometimes we have to let the ductus close to assure that we, have no, we do not have coarctation. And finally, um, Left juxtaposition of the atrial appendages can be seen in association with transposition of the great arteries. And here you see the uh, atrial appendage crossing over uh, to uh, the left side. And uh, as uh, Lee Benson alluded to, this is important, particularly if you're trying to determine the atrial communication um, and be able to do an atrial septostomy. In this setting, the atrial septum appears perpendicular to the diaphragm. And you also will see absence of the secondary septum here uh, as the uh, appendage crosses its way over. And you'll see bidirectional color flow in that setting. And here you see the juxtaposed atrial appendage. So in conclusion, uh, echo can make the entire pre-surgical diagnosis. Anatomy will dictate surgical strategy and you uh, need to look for all the variations you can see in anatomy. Uh, Transposition with intact, uh, intact ventricular septum requires an adequate atrial shunt. As you've heard, 40 to 50% of patients will have a VSD, which can be any subtype, and outlow uh, outflow obstruction uh, is with malalignment, and coronary artery anomalies are quite common. Look in front, between, and behind the great arteries to give you clues to those diagnoses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Merrill. Um, it's been a, a terrific session leading up to the surgical management of this disease. Uh, a very active Q&A box. We've had an active chat box. Uh, I'm getting texts. There's all sorts of things that are happening which are really fun with this technology. Um, Grace, do we have audience poll ready to go? Uh, we take a little break between now and the surgery or should we wait a little bit, Grace? We are ready to do the pool for, uh, to the audience. Audience, uh, yes. Sasha, can you can you release the the pool? Yes. So we we have uh, we ask you to answer. So everybody can answer very quickly the questions that we are going to to make, and then we are going to discuss. So the the first one uh, is very on demographics and. Uh, he loves this uh, pool. Huh? How come she who must be obeyed is not on here? <laughs> at, at the moment, Lowell can be happy for us because at the moment we have more than 50% of answer. And I will show you the, the main results are is very interesting. You must be happy. They're not showing, Sasha. You're going to put them up? Yes, shortly? yes. Coming. Okay. No, no. <clears throat> Terrific. <laughs> and another question that we like to share is about uh, 
where you live, where the people that are connected with us. This is the area of uh, Dr. Van Leuven. Here he is. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much, everybody. We are so happy to have people from Latin America <laughs> very present uh, again. We are uh, very, very happy for that. Thank so you. We have a poll from uh, Bob. A question from Bob. Bob, you want to present your... Uh... I think that this time, uh, hopefully I've um, made the question correct. Uh, only one of these statements is incorrect. So we all should now be telling me, you should all be slotting which of these is incorrect. Is it incorrect to say that the essence is discordant ventricular arterial connections? Is it incorrect to say that those discordant connections are found most frequently when the atrioventricular connections are concordant? Is it incorrect to say the discordantly connected aorta is always located anteriorly and to the right? Is it incorrect to say the coronary arteries arise from those sinuses of the aorta adjacent to the pulmonary trunk? Or is it incorrect to say the most frequent associated lesion? is a ventricular septal defect. So only one of these is incorrect. And this time, hopefully, everybody is ticking the right box. Uh, it's great to hear your real voice instead of what you sounded like before on an old radio. Yeah. It's, it's the know. At least doing it the other way, we knew I wasn't going to go very far over time. <laughs> Here we go. We have 50% of people. Bob, this is... Ah. We're doing much better. And indeed, the correct answer is that the discordantly connected aorta is not always located anteriorly to the right. And Merrill reinforced that so beautifully in her presentation. And I must say, Merrill's presentation was a wonderful parallel to what I had said in describing the morphology. And for a rare moment, Professor Anderson, we are in entire agreement. Indeed, it's good to see we are moving forward. Now we have a question from Mike Seed, uh, Paul from Mike Seed. Now he's coming. Mike is there or he left? I'm here. See, if you want, you can uh, read your. I'll let people read it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a shame that F and G are on the same line. But if you if you want to check F and G, you can just click that one. <laughs> when we reach at least 30%, Mike, we will see the... People is going very fast. I probably gave too many selections. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do much better with yes no questions. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Are you happy? Excellent, yes. Um just to clarify, Mike, that's older age at surgery, right? Yeah, just older age at surgery and the presence of a ventricular septal defect would be correct. Gil, you want to send your question? I sent three to Grace. Are they ready to go or not? Yes. Here we go. Okay, so after a successful septostomy, and I'll, I'll define successful as you can see, a large uh, hole on, on the echo and a flapping septum primum at my institution. There's not a right answer here. I'm just curious what people do. Um, at my institution, we stop, for prostaglandin, stop the prostaglandin and monitor for hypoxemia, keep the prostaglandin until surgery or other. I can say is. a... Uh... 80% they look at this. <clears throat> so four out of five doctors recommend stopping prostaglandin. Okay. What do you do at, uh, at uh, I'm going to pull the, the rest of the panelists. Mar uh, Dr. Jatin, 
What's done at your institution with uh, prostaglandin? Uh, we usually keep the pr prostaglandin until surgery. Uh, we don't usually uh, stop the post prostaglandin. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, which is very, very well presented, but uh, we, we always uh, keep the prostaglandin until the surgery and, and stop in the OR or just briefly uh, when the child is coming to the, to the OR. Understood. And Emery, how about in Marie Lang Long? We, after 35 years, we didn't decide it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very American of you. <laughs> Dr. Fraser, I see you're on the line. Welcome, Chuck. Um, uh, what's going? I don't know if you're if you're on. Uh, hey, good morning. It's uh, done at Dell Children's with, uh, with Mr. Glenn. Uh, well, uh, your experience is exactly what ours is. We like to get people off, but during the night when uh, patients desaturate, we'll get them back on it. Night. So we just can't can't win. <laughs> I responded to one of our panelists about the same. It's, it always seems at, at night. Um, it's, yeah. a good, it's a good segue into the next question. What did we get for the results? Uh, do we put the next one up there? Okay, so this will be interesting. So if prostaglandin has been stopped, usually by me, after the septostomy, and now it's nighttime, always, what would I do with prostaglandin? Where would my threshold be to restart prostaglandin? Below 60, below 70, below... Very fast, very fast answer. I will finish because people want to answer. Right. We may not be right, but we're sure. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So the plurality, but not the majority, close to it below 70. It's always hard to know whether a dip below 70 or sustained below 70. And then the last question I want to ask, which will be a great segue into Dr. Jatin's uh, talk, is about age at surgery. In an otherwise, uh, you put that one up, Grace, in an otherwise uncomplicated um, baby with, uh, out, without low birth weight, without pulmonary hypertension without all that stuff. Um, when do we usually recommend an arterial switch operation? This is a mutuate from uh, Emre. Emre, oh, this okay. comes from you. So we had two separate questions. I'm curious to see what the differences are. So when do you perform switch and simple TGA? Emre, is it okay if I read your question? Okay. Um, day zero, avoiding balloon septostomy. As early as possible after birth, septostomy is not between day four, septostomy or not, between day four and seven after birth and after the first week of life. And we'll, we'll make the same assumptions, Emery. No, no other complications, prematurity, all that sort of stuff. A straightforward baby with transposition. Okay, we, yeah, I'm interested, but the tendency is uh, for between four and seven days. Okay, Grace, do you still have the question the way I asked it? I'm curious to see if people answer the question differently. Because this um, there's data coming out from it. Grace, do you have it or no? Because we can just go right on if, if we don't. No, no, we don't. Okay, perfect. Um, so with that in mind, uh, who's up from our group, Sasha? Who's going to introduce? Now is Grace. Grace. Yeah, it's a, a big uh, honor for me. So we are going to continue to the second part. We are going to talk about uh, surgery. If uh, is there international consensus on surgical technique in 2020? And the first speaker is uh, the president of the World Society of Pediatric and Congenital uh, Heart Surgery and the uh, director of the Pediatric Cardiac Surgeon at Heart Institute in Sao Paulo, Brazil where I had the honor to be trained. It was a privilege for me to be trained there. And he is going to talk about the arterial switch operation of 45 years uh, journey. Uh, welcome and thank you very much, Marcelo. Muito, muito obrigada. Thank you, Grace. Obrigado. Uh, thank you, Sasha and Gil. It's a, it's a quite pleasure mm -hmm. and very emotional day for me. Today is the, the, my father's birthday, so uh, we will be celebrating as, in, in many, many aspects. Uh, I have uh, 
let me try to fix it. I have no disclosures. And before talking about a 45 years journey after the surgery, the description of the surgery, I think we might mention some previous 178 years before uh, another journey that began with, when Professor Anderson uh, showed us with Dr. Bailey's description of the, 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 the defect. Uh, and the term transposition of, of the great arteries was first used by Farr in 1814. And after that, the first uh, palliative operation with success in uh, improving results was, was performed by Dr. Bladelock and Dr. Hanlon in 1984, opening a, uh, making a surgical atrial septectomy. Uh, and after that, many other attempts were done, like Lee High and Parkon in 1953, the partial venous switch, which is uh, the initial operations before the atrial switch, and uh, one that uh, had an, some uh, another importance was by Thomas Bates in 1955, with no cardiopulmonary bypass, made a, a connection of the inferior vena cava uh, to the to the, the left atrium and uh, the right uh, veins, pulmonary veins to the left uh, to the right atrium. And uh, after this period, many uh, arterial operations attempts were done. And, but finally, the most successful operations began with Dr. Senning's description and Dr. Muster's des description of the atrial switches uh, that made a big success and was the choice uh, for treating transposition for many, many, many years. Uh, as mentioned before, Dr. Harshkin and Miller in 1966 made a, a very important contribution with the uh, atrial septostomy, the balloon uh, septostomy. And just mentioning some of the arterial operations uh, that were tried before 1975, uh, we can mention Dr. Bailey in 54 and Mustard in 54 that tried to to make uh, 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 arterial approaches, but with no coronary approaches. Uh, Mustard in 54 had a left coronary transfer with the aorta, but just the left coronary. Uh, K cross, K and cross in 1955, and Sani in 59, made two other attempts of arterial approaches, but with no coronary approach. The coronary were left in the same site. And the, the first uh, uh, description of both coronary transfers were done, was done in 1961 by Idris when he tried the coronary transfer with an aortic ring. It was not successful, but keeping the concept that you can only, only uh, switch the, the, the vessels, the great vessels, but we might transfer the coronary arteries. And another attempt was done by Balderman in 74 with the coronary transfer with the distal aorta uh, with no success yet. Uh, and what's the rationale for insisting in an arterial operation? Uh, despite the acceptable uh, results with the atrial switches, uh, there were uh, worst results in DSD cases. And there was a, a continuous search of a definitive anatomical correction. Of course, we might have some anatomical requirements for total arterial correction, like Bethesda's translocation, the left ventricle must be paired. But the biggest problem uh, remained over the coronary artery transfer from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Beginning our 45 years journey in 1975, uh, Dr. Ajib Jateni described uh, the arterial switch operation uh, in, uh, in babies with VSDs and, all, uh, and not in the neonatal period. And after him, uh, his uh, successful description, uh, many uh, fantastic surgeons made a lot of different co contributions, like Dr. Professor Yacoub in 76, with this two-stage uh, repair uh, with the pulmonary artery bending to prepare the left ventricle. Professor Yves Leconte in 81 uh, described his, the, the maneuver that is still being used today, transferring the pulmonary arteries anterior to the aorta. And uh, Dr. Castaneda and other authors uh, described the use uh, of the, uh, the, the, the concept of the arterial switch, the Jatani operation, for the neonate. And uh, in 89, Dr. Jonas uh, described the rapid two-stage repair with the PA banding and the Blalock-Talsic shunt. 
But uh, as Abraham Lincoln has said, uh, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. Uh, so I think that's the same position that Dr. Jateni had in, the, in, in, in that situation. Uh, despite being a natural researcher and an outstanding surgeon and uh, not knowing all the concepts that we know now about physiopathology, indications, and surgical concepts, he tried to do the best planning that he could. Uh, where we are in, in the 70s, the pediatric cardiac surgery knowledge in 75 in Brazil, we had very competent and experienced surgeons, large experience with adults, adult surgeries, but very few experience with small children and neonates. The, the procedures were considered high-risk procedures. We have poor ICU and hospital structure. And uh, uh, we can only understand better the normal and the pathological physiology with just with heart specimens. That's what he did. These are some of the, of the specimens that he used to understand the anatomical relations in the normal heart. And these are some experience he did with uh, uh, resin models, trying to understand the relations uh, uh, of the rings the pulmonary and the, 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 the aortic rings, trying to understand the great vessels relations, being anteroposterior or side by side, and mainly trying to understand uh, uh, what's the best way to transfer the coronary arteries. Uh, uh, here is the coron right coronary artery must be transferred to this position and the left. And uh, uh, help in this situation, there was a large experience has been is been performed a lot of uh, coronary artery bypass grafts more than 2000 cases and the saphenous vein graft implantations in different sites of the aortas as we can see here and there was a lot of research about coronary circulation and then finally in 75 he performed the first anatomic correction uh, successful anatomic correction of the transposition of the great vessels uh, and this is a historical picture of the first child to survive. Uh, the, the child was sent in the cat lab, and this is the right ventricle connected to the pulmonary artery and the left ventricle connected to the aorta. Uh, considering the, 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 the surgical concepts that we had and that he had in the, that moment, uh, uh, the initial operations, the great arteries were excised, were uh, cut in different levels. Uh, this uh, brought some problems like the need of uh, uh, grafts of conduits to repair the pulmonary artery. And the coronary artery translocation was performed by a small button surrounding the, the ostium. And the reconstruction of the great arteries were performed with the anastomosis in different levels, but left side by side, not with the Lecomte maneuver that was not described at that moment yet. I want to share this uh, interesting video with you. This was during a celebration of the 30 years of the uh, Jateni operation in Sao Paulo during a, a meeting that was the, the, the first survivors were there to pay a tribute for him. And then he had the opportunity to describe uh, uh, how was the presentation in the Henry Ford Symposium.
just hit it. And after the presentation, he, he sent a lot of uh, manuscripts to different surgeons in the world and received a lot of letters back, like this one from Dr. Senning that said that you su succeed in doing what a lot of us try to do experimentally and clinic it for the last 20 years, from Dr. Mustard that said, although you have to be a damn good surgeon, uh, from Dr. Debeke that said that this certainly is the most ingenious procedure from Dr. Cooley that said this operation may become the one of choice for transposition of the great arteries. Uh, and from Dr. Ross that said that he has provided a stimulus to thousands of us around the world. And finally, Dr. Castaneda's letter that said, uh, among a lot of things, that you have made an epoch-making contribution and electrified the surgical world. Uh, and after, when, well, after he finished his presentation, Dr. John Kirkling, who was uh, uh, coordinating the the, the, the the session said that but there must be some problems uh, will the anastomosis grow appropriately can it be reproducibly uh, will the result two three four ten years after the surgery is as good as the baffle or the atrial switch operations uh, we we i think we now have most of these answers uh, this was the initial results uh, a very high mortality in the initial cases and this is a, a recent uh, experience for, for our, our group in the heart hospital uh, with uh, very acceptable results. And here is the, with an overall mortality of 5.5%, with the 2.3% in type A coronaries. And uh, when we have other coronary anomalies, we have a higher, higher mortality. Uh, and the, I think the whole world, like this data from the Pediatric Cardiac Care Consortium, has shown that since the beginning of the use of the operation in neonates, uh, the, the, the mortality, the 30-day and the hospital mortality was very high in the beginning, and then time after time, year after year, the mortality was coming to a level that is uh, reproduced by most of the centers in the world. And the most frequent complication described was the supravalvar pulmonary stenosis around 10% of the cases, uh, the aortic stenosis in 5%, the aortic root dilatation, it's nearly universal, and the regurgitation in most of the cases, but 
moderate or severe in less than 10% of the cases. Uh, coronary occlusion in a low number of cases, few number of cases, sudden, sudden death also, and aortic dissection and rupture is still unknown. But we might uh, use the information we have during these 45 years to prevent the late complications, like an adequate indication, uh, considering timing and everything that was discussed, our criteria's operation with extensive dissection of the great vessels, uh, uh, the care with the new aorta length to avoid compression of the pulmonary arteries, the coronary translocation if it's open or closed uh, technique, then the new pulmonary artery, artery reconstruction, uh, uh, and of course, a frequent clinical follow up. Uh, just to show uh, a brief video showing that we consider it it's very, very important uh, to release completely the pulmonary arteries, as uh, we, we can see uh, here, the left pulmonary artery and then the right one. Uh, and uh, another point that we consider important is to make first, uh, this is our uh, personal preference, to reconstruct the knee aorta and then to find the best position to place uh, the coronary uh, the coronary buttons uh, trying to avoid the commissures and to put in a position avoiding kinkings and leakings uh, and the supravalvular pulmonary stenosis uh, could be the new aorta when the new aorta becomes uh, longer with a length a long length it could compress and stretch the both pulmonary arteries called in this uh, kind of situation. And uh, the use of uh, a patch, the patches that were used in the past to reconstruct the new PA uh, were uh, preferably uh, uh, used by bovine pericardium. And, and what we observed during the, the years is that there was a retraction of the patch. And we can see here in one of the cases where the patch retracts completely in the valsalva in the, in the, 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 the sinus and when we reset the patches, we can have a better valve and reconstruct uh, with uh, other tissue. Like uh, uh, we are using now uh, a single patch with fresh autologous pericardium. I think all these technical aspects will be shown uh, in the next presentations. Uh, another point is about the aortic regurgitation. This is an experience for Dr. Lang's group that showed that most of the cases uh, there is uh, uh, an increase in the grade of the aortic insufficiency coming more than 20 years to the grade one and between one and two. And, uh, but uh, there are freedom for aortic insufficient. Most of the cases with intact septum and after that was the VSD and the talcic mean and double outlet uh, right ventricle with uh, more a grade three and four uh, uh, aortic regurgitation. Another aspect, as everybody knows, that the right-sided pathology uh, are the most responsible for the first three operations. This is a study from the Mayo Clinic by Joe Durrani and his colleagues. But the left-sided pathology must be considered. And uh, there's, the, there is a lot of cases coming uh, that we need to replace the, the, the aortic valve, the, replace the aortic root, and repair the valve or make a patch and a loplasty like uh, because the cases are coming, the indications could be earlier to avoid the aortic valve deterioration. We had in our, in our group eight recent cases from 19, 14 to 19 with five bental de bono operations and three uh, preserved aortic valve with the Tyron David uh, technique. Uh, finally, uh, I will use some very few minutes uh, of this presentation uh, to, to pay a tribute to... to uh, to, to, to Dr. Hateni, and uh, uh, th there is a word in Portuguese that's called saudade. Uh, there's no translation to English, but it's something like missing, longing, and yearning. It's a big wish of meeting again, touching again, or just remembering. Uh, it's surrounded by uh, good feelings and a great desire of sharing great moments on his personal history. And it's an opportunity to keep, of keeping closer uh, which is exactly what what we are doing today. And uh, there is a lot of things about his history, a lot of uh, contributions to the science. Here's the web of science, a lot of citations. It's an H index of 40 during all his, his career, uh, a lot of 
uh, articles, seating articles, uh, and uh, many, many aspects. Just a brief history. He was born in a very small city called Chapuri in the state of Acre. Here is Brazil, and here is Bolivia. It's in the border of Bolivia, just in the middle of the Amazon uh, forest. And he came to a city in the southeast called Uberlândia with the age of 10, came, in, came by boat, and he took uh, more than 40 days to come from Chapuri uh, to the southeast. And then he decided to study medicine. Here he is him as a medical student. He graduated in 1953 and uh, uh, had a, a strict relation with Professor Zerbini in the two last years of his graduation and after that. Uh, he's one of his mentors. He had performed, the teams led by him had performed more than 100,000 cardiac surgeries here in Brazil. And he personally had performed more than 40,000 surgeons as the first surgeon. And he practiced, uh, daily practice, till the age of 82. And then he needed to stop because of a terrible back pain uh, that costs uh, uh, some surgeries to, to, to fix the problem. Uh, he had a lot of uh, experience with experimental laboratory and he had a lot of personal creations like artificial hearts, artificial heart valves, pacemakers, defibrillators, cardiopulmonary machines, and oxygenators, uh, VADs. He was working in a VAD when he passed away and research with a lot of anatomical vessels. He was still the dean of the medical school uh, during four years and he always had. Uh, a vision uh, to be to have no political part, but he assumed uh, a lot of governmental positions, like the the health state secretary of of the state of São Paulo. Uh, here is his during uh, among the population, and uh, he was health minister of the country in two different governments, from Fernando Collor and Fernando Henrique Cardoso, when he. Uh, he said that the main problem of the poor people is that they only have poor friends. There's none for them. And this is uh, uh, reality in our country. Uh, his, his main hobby was he was a farmer. And here's a farm that he had. And here is my mother. And he liked very much to, to, to have a lot of uh, activities on the farm, like riding horses, cattle, and agriculture. Uh, we are in four, four brothers. There are two, two men and two women. Uh, three of us are medical doctors, two surgeons, and a pediatric cardiologist. And I have a sister that is an architect. And here is part of the family with the four sons, with a part of the grandsons. And here is the family growing with a lot of grandsons and uh, a, a lot of people. He liked to say a lot of phrases and he write a lot of things. And, uh, but one of his trademarks was that is, that is said that I never discuss the problems. There are people that loses themselves discussing the problems. I just discuss solutions and, that's, and, and we can confirm this. And he's a very religious person and uh, uh, following the thoughts of Mother uh, Teresa from Calcutta, he said that the, the opposite of fear is not courage, but faith. And he never complained. I'm, 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 uh, I, I can confirm that. And he always said that the present is wonderful. Uh, I had a privilege to, to introduce him during the, 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 the meeting of the World Society of Pediatric and Congenital Heart Surgery that was, uh, that was held here in Sao Paulo in 2014. I introduced him for what was his, light scientific, uh, his last scientific presentation. Uh, he passed away uh, some few months after this presentation for a, a public of close to 700 people, and he was applauded for two or three minutes, I'm not sure, uh, after his, his presentation. Here is the third generation of the family. Uh, uh, two of my sons are his uh, resident in cardiac surgery, and she's a pediatric cardiologist. He's my uh, uh, son-in-law. He's a uh, uh, anesthesiologist, my sister, oh, so we are in the third generation of the family. And finally, I just want to thank Marsha Jacobs and Christo Chervenkov that wrote in the World Journal a tribute to the patriarch, saying that uh, 
uh, I have seen further, uh, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. Uh, while the metaphor is much used, it's difficult for, uh, for any congenital heart surgeon to think of shoulders broader, more robust, or more welcoming than those of Professor Jatini. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Uh, if we were in a big, uh, in a big uh, conference room at this moment, there was a standing ovation. Because thanks, Marcelo, you give us. Uh, it seems like we were in in a room. Uh, we saw also the chat from the people, and uh, thanks again. We really don't uh, don't believe what you are giving us. I'm sure is not uh, possible to feel what uh, your uh, father uh, lived. But now we have to go in, go on, and uh, I ask uh, Davide Calvaruso that is uh, my associate here in Taormina that was trained by this guy from uh, Marina Lenon, Professor M. Rebelli, that I would like to introduce him. David. David, just put, David, before you start, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Some things have been coming up on the chat. This will be recorded and will be on our uh, YouTube channel. Please follow us on social media. And many of the things that uh, Dr. Jatani just talked about in terms of long-term follow-up will be amplified in great degree in our, the part two of transposition, which is on July 2nd. Davide. Okay, thanks, Gil. So hello, everybody, and thanks to Marcelo Giatene. How beautiful history is and past for our future. Well, I am proud to introduce to you all uh, Professor Emre Belli, Director of the Department of Pediatric and Congenital Disease at Marie Lane Long Hospital in, uh, in France. I am very happy to uh, present Professor Emre Belli uh, for at least two reasons. First of all, because uh, uh, Marie Lane Long Group uh, uh, represents a very important piece of history uh, in treatment of TGA. And this group uh, has contributed uh, substantially to the clinical uh, literature about the transposition. Uh, remember Professor uh, Claude Planchet. The second reason is that I worked with, uh, I had the pleasure to work with Emre Belli for two years and I learned a lot uh, from him. And not all in surgery, I'm talking about uh, all the Russian films, movies, uh, and uh, music, uh, jazz, uh, uh, electronic, electro jazz, and so on. Actually, Emre, uh, was the first for me to demystify arterial switch operation, explaining me how to perform this operation and making it simple. So, Emre, thank you very much to be here with us. Thank you, Davide. Let's go because we have a, we must be short in time. Um, okay. So arterial switch of operation is not that rare. We, we perform an all type of transposition, but also uh, um, double outlet with uh, subpulmonary VST and also in uh, very challenging uh, non-committed VST cases where it, it is more suitable, it's rare, but uh, challenging. To the... Um, to the pulmonary infundibulum, then uh, make a switch. Uh, Marina Nong's uh, history is uh, contemporary with Boston uh, in transposition of great arteries after the failure of a um, very uh, talented surgeon. I think simultaneously in uh, both sides of the ocean, neonatal switch has become a procedure uh, routine procedure for the treatment of the uh, transposition of great arteries uh, thanks uh, big efforts of both uh, cardiologist, surgeon, and intensivist. Many improvements occurred. Prenatal diagnosis has changed uh, dramatically the aspect of this uh, pathology. Uh, monitoring techniques improved. Uh, My is based on the technique introduced by Claude Clanchet, which is maybe 
a little bit be a little bit more adapted to different conditions. However, um, it uh, it became a standard repository technical in, for all types of the transposition uh, cases, which with the improvements of the post-operative care, all these um, all these improvements uh, resulted in the uh, limiting the exposure of the babies to the uh, uh, deleterious effects that we know. This is a recent study that not yet published where there were uh, a, a certain amount of simple consecutive simple TJ were analyzed and you can observe how uh, things has changed in time. Um, that's, let's say, uh, in 2004 and 5, and uh, the unique thing we didn't change is the uh, prostaglandin. The remaining uh, parameters shows how the uh, out uh, management has improved and as well as the outcome. So what is Sasha put the title of perfect switch? What is a perfect switch which I um, call routine switch? How it must be in my unknown at least. Uh, all is here, it must be, as the techniques are well defined and we don't cool, we don't warm, uh, the surgery takes around two hours with uh, less than half uh, necessary for the, to perform the repair with uh, one uh, pack of plasma, fresh frozen plasma, Normothermia and intermittent anti-grade aerobic cardiac arrest, despite the uh, six minutes that it adds uh, five minutes, it is that's a cross clamp time. We don't put any more the big chest frames, and uh, we use in the almost all patients, at least uh, until the uh, intensive care, maybe some vasopressor can be necessary if the patient has to remain intubated. But enoximon has dramatically dramatically improved the the stability of the patients. Only morphine morphine in ICU, early extubation, the the hours following uh, intensive care stay, and of course no residual lesion. There are additional resin too, the, uh, except some pulmonary trivial regurgitation, which. One where we analyzed this 901 patients, the statistical technique is very long to explain. However, many of them are without prenatal diagnosis. Uh, the, what we found out <coughs> that the best time to perform is around seventh day, seven to eight day. In terms of mortality, of course, in terms of uh, length of ICU stay also, because mortality can be put under the shoulder of coronary ischemia. However, uh, length of uh, uh, ICU stay is uh, mainly related to the management, but also the patient's condition as the management is stable, uh, is fixed for everybody. Uh, no hurry to go fast and no, way to, no, no need to wait too much, as uh, showed our friend from uh, the analysis of brain MR. So nowadays we perform according to the weekends, uh, around the fifth day, the switch procedure. Uh, we wait one week when there is a TGA, VAST, aortic ductus dependent, aortic arch obstruction. And um, TGA, VAST is according to clinical tolerance. However, it can go up to one month. But one shall know that uh, if there is a light um, light uh, subpulmonary sub uh, pulmonary stenosis with a good pulmonary valve. Uh, if you wait uh, more than five six weeks, this stenosis will be emphasized in time. Um, so surgical anatomy is very well uh, showed by both uh, Bob Anderson and uh, Meryl. Um, coronary malalignment is a severe issue. 
pre-op investigations shall emphasize this parameter. Coronary artery classification, there are many. We have also our own classifications, but it seems that in, U in Europe, we, people use more Jakub classification and uh, in US more uh, Leiden classification. However, uh, you have the normal anatomy, loop anatomy, interarterial, intramural coronary anatomy, and the single coronary artery showed shortly here. So, uh, two things, uh, pericardium, we use it, it fresh, but uh, it doesn't change too much if you want to uh, uh, fix it. Uh, at least in follow-up, it doesn't change anything. And um, I personally use a tan pericardium uh, when I do a TT, TGA multiple VST where uh, there will be VST and bending at the switch and bending at the end of the procedure. And we keep the pleura uh, closed if we can um, because uh, for the mechanical of the lungs, mechanical uh, status of the lungs is much more better, in particular when you do surgery in normothermia. This is an L malposition, which is a rare condition. So Planchet was saying that the uh, the heart uh, view is like a map. It shows you uh, many, it tells you many stories. You have to know how to read it. Like this corner, real sub aortic RVO2 or this guy, but this coronary goes there because there is some muscle to irrigate. Um, this is for the um, more for medical. Uh, regular anterior posterior normal coronary anatomy uh, switch is on in OR with a comfortable aorta. So we tend to you cut the aorta relatively high uh, before complete section you have to check out inside if there are uh, uh, superiorly positioned uh, coronary arteries it can happen so you have to be and you cannot see always from the outside of the heart. And from another patient, but it shows well, uh, you have to, after the aortic section, you have to dissect interaortic pulmonary uh, space deep as possible until the myocardium. Of course, uh, if you know that the patient has an infundibular VSC, you have to, to not to go that far because you will be en entering in it. However, you have to see the continuing the procedure. Uh, coronary harvesting, you have to privilege the button. So you see the you see the ostia first I always start from the right side um, and I I uh, harvest the coronary with scissors uh, in a with a large cuff allowing to to uh, let's say uh, compensate any any small mild uh, imperfection while uh, reimplanting uh, after the uh, intimal section you can use the bovi electrical uh, bistory uh, cautery uh, to mobilize the coronary uh, we are not big fan of extensive mobilization always You, because um, the uh, the uh, when you skeletonize the uh, coronary when it's not necessary, uh, you have to be sure that uh, uh, you have to be sure that uh, you will not uh, make kinking of the coronary. Uh, this is the uh, section of the pulmonary trunk, uh, low section just above the tip of the commissures. Uh, and the, this is the Leconte maneuver. Once the maneuver is, we change the place of the clamp and we, we uh, put stitches on the commissures and this particular patient has major malalignment of commissures, as you see. Commissures are laterally and the uh, anteriorly there is a commissure.
afterwards there is trapdoor i i always uh, use trapdoor for the left coronary artery since it is not a loop anterior looping um, coronary sometimes it can be not necessary but let's say uh, if you don't know do the trapdoor for the left one afterwards the uh, uh, six o'clock of the uh, cuff should come in the angles of the trapdoor so you have to stitch we use ato for the coronaries you have to stitch and you have to adjust gather with uh, with uh, larger bites on the coronary and closer bites in the aorta in order to create a sort of uh, 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 avoiding stretching in the wrong sense and permitting to to enter edge all the adjusting the sutures uh, the left coronary shall be above the below the level of the ostia sh shall be below the level of the uh, tip of the commissures uh, for the right one it the ostia should be above um, so you make a small incision some some colleagues didn't do any incision i do a small incision and uh, fix this that way uh, this congruence is corrected by uh, adjusting the suture line main in the left side uh, but we can do a small counter incision for the left and uh, uh, more important because he is higher positioned uh, counter incision for the right coronary uh, adjusting the suture line and also uh, avoiding any stricture the, the risk uh, is uh, small this is from um, last century because we're using crystalloid cardioplegia, but at 30 minute cardioplegia, already you can see that the coronaries looks uh, satisfying. You, you're already happy and you can think to what you will eat in the lunch. Uh, pericardial patch shall be uh, generously, generously uh, harvested and uh, inserted by suture line and respecting commissure if there is no detachment of the commissure. Once the pericardial patch is distal, proximally inserted, we uh, uh, de-air the left cavities and we complete the procedure by the establishment of the continuity of the RVO2 by pulmonary anastomosis. So this is the regular cases. However, challenging and influences outcomes because we still uh, lose we are still losing patients for coronary uh, ischemia it's rare but it happens uh, this is a type c let's say both coronary from si right sinus uh, the strategy is always the same um, we harvest a common cuff a common cuff uh, we detach the, uh, you see the left and right osseous. You have the uh, intramural course uh, of the coronary. We detach the commissure first and then harvest both coronary artery uh, with a common cuff uh, from one commissure to the other because this shall be uh, the intramural, you don't know how far. to the anterior commission of the pulmonary artery. Um, it's a very meticulous time because this defines how, how much tissue you will have to stitch. And, and, and uh, if you miss tissue, you can be in trouble despite uh, proper implantation positioning of the coronary. Once the coronary cuff harvested, we check the intramural course and we unroof. The unroofing uh, shall go as far as possible 
uh, of course, is not the uh, uh, same uh, size and condition of the anocore patient, but you can still add a stitch one if you go outside of the uh, intimal continuity. The common cuff into uh, balanced cuff, uh, leaving enough tissue in both sides. This is our standard approach. Uh, I always be I always be able to do this in type C patients, despite some cases appear to be single coronary. In this ca case, uh, the left coronary is uh, more extensively mobilized because it comes from the sin right sinus. So the positioning shall be different. This type, this procedure was performed in the uh, er, in the eighties. Uh, Claude Planchet used Gore-Tex patch harvested with uh, uh, harvested from a uh, conduit in order to keep the convexity with uh, close to five hundred switch cases. Uh, one word for the VST, we always close in the majority of the clays VST from the PA. At early exp experience, right ventricular anatomy was performed, but uh, uh, in the 90s, we observed that when we close the upper, this anterior cusp of the pulmonary artery was uh suffering and aortic insufficiency was not uncommon so we modified the technique and the roof and the upper edge of the ventricle septal defect stitches we are passing from uh, in right ventricle to the left through intervenular septum or sometimes from outside to inside from the right uh, wall you have a double loop, you don't stretch the coronary, you can put easily from here inside the plagiated stitch to fix the coronary. Our thick arch obstruction, quartation or interrupted arch, at early experience we used uh, direct anastomosis, then switch, but this congruence shall be corrected. We are using a homograph patch or pericardial patch, uh, not as Hypoplastic, not as generous as hypoplastic left heart because you have the Leconte maneuver, but this is also a standardized technique. So, to to uh, make a sort of um, sort of um, uh, list of tricks, so AST we always close. The supposed benefit of residual um, shunt is. demonstrated. So if there is a problem, you add another unknown parameter to the coefficient. So both, all shunts are closed. Pericardial patch must be large, enough large. Um, aorta is section high and PA low because many reason coronary will be will go up and the uh, pulmonary artery will not be stretched by a huge aorta behind. Mainly this two reason. Uh, don't hesitate to detach pulmonary valve comm commissure if you your cuff will not be enough large. Um, so left coronary is slightly below the commissure, right ostia slightly above the commissure. The discongruence adjustment is not from the uh, you start at the uh, at six o'clock for both ascending aorta and the pulmonary artery. Don't gather, don't adjust because right coronary artery don't have to go back. However, on the left side hand, uh, right side hand, I mean the left side of the uh, suture line, you have you can adjust as far as you you, you want. The counter incision helps to uh, to correct the discongruence. And if it's a older patient with tau being anomaly and huge uh, huge uh, no coarctation, you don't have to enlarge the aortic arch and huge uh, pulmonary artery, you can make a triangle resection 
uh, from the posterior sinus and stitch it. It doesn't destabilize the neoaortic valve. Um, if the distal pulmonary pathway is restrictive, be very careful. You can use a uh, locked suture. Uh, uh, coronary loops in presence If, if you have an anterior loop, you have to uh, insert the pericardial patch before the, uh, before the um, insertion, reimplantation of the coronary. It's much more easier. Uh, when you decannulate with anterior loop, don't pull back the PA because you will stretch, you will stretch the uh, infundibulum and you will make ischemia. And more you stretch, more you have edema, attention. Uh, in particular in uh, Tau Zigbing with double loop. Um, type C, uh, we explain uh, during, the, during the video, left coronary shall come above the suture line. It has, it has to be avoided to, to King because you have a segment at the end of the uh, intramural course where you have a rich On a normal ad coronary adventitia, neonatal coronary adventitia, this area must be straightforward, not kink. Um, if you have a side by side uh, relationship, great artist, don't hesitate to displace the distal anastomosis of the pulmonary artery to the right side, avoiding stretching of the left PA, in particular if you have a aortic arch obstruction patch. Uh, because of that reason, the proximal patch size must be not huge in this condition. And if you have a TGA VST coartation, always have a look below the uh, native aortic valve on the RVO2. You will, uh, there will be a parietal muscular bend to divide, which will uh, uh, solve any, many problems. This three condition is uh, to be debated. to three uh, another uh, presentation which is the biggest split pulmonary valve and LVO2 where our study showed that when the uh, risk starts when the z-score is below uh, is uh, uh, below one my minus 1.8 multiple VSTs in presence we prefer not primary PA bending but we do uh, uh, switch and bending eventually closing the principal VST uh, and uh, expecting spontaneous closure or uh, surgery in a larger patient. Uh, late referral is rare. However, we use rapid two-stage uh, below a certain age and also if the myocardial mass and mass volume index is not satisfactory. And to finish my tribute to Claude Planchet, my Jacqueline who are the principal contributors to this program. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Emre. As you say, as uh, we say that we are very lucky in Europe because uh, the school of uh, Paris was uh, an amazing school for all the European surgeons, at least. But. Now we discuss with uh, Gil Bernowski that I was so happy because today we have the opportunity to have the three perspective. We have the Brazilian, South American perspective. We have the European perspective. And now it's time to have the USA perspective. So I thank you very much and sorry for the delay in time to Professor Frazier, who is director at Dell Children's Hospital in Austin. And of course, he will talk about uh, very long personal experience with the transposition of the grid arteries. Mm -hmm. What's happening? I don't know. You should be on here, no?